It's a great pleasure to be here at uh, Guy's and St Thomas's. That's where I'm from. Um, in case you don't know this hospital, in fact, I uh, want to thank my colleagues for covering me while I'm talking. Actually, they're all here. So uh, I don't know who's looking after the patients right now. Um, my topic is uh, DOAX and CAT, so sometimes known as NOAX and CAT, or just the modern anticoagulants and cancer-associated thrombosis. Uh, these are my disclosures and uh, for honoraria and support. Uh, as you can see, I'm potentially completely conflicted, and if you're from a company and your name isn't up there, come and see me after the talk. <laughs> I'm going to start with my conclusions because I know you've just had morning tea and there's plenty of coffee but you need to rest. You've had so much information today and so I thought I'll start with my conclusions or my take home messages, let you agree or disagree with them and then away we go. So low molecular weight heparin is more effective than VKA for cat, that's for sure. I'm not going to show you any evidence for that because the other speakers have already shown you evidence for that. NOAX or DOAX appear to be as good as or better than VKA for CAT. That's my other conclusion. NOAX or VKI, VKA can be used to treat CAT in the following circumstances. If there's a low risk of recurrence, if there's a patient is no longer severely ill, and I'll come back to that, or they're, they're not severely ill. If there's indefinite anticoagulation and the cancer is inactive, it seems very reasonable. And finally, the, the one time I think you do need to talk to your patients about their preference, and I, I avoid the preference thing because I think we, 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 of course we need to listen to our patients, but we need to make, give them the decision so that they give them a, the information so the decisions are relatively clear. But if they prefer an oral therapy over an injectable, then we need to take that in mind too. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> I'm going to sit, uh, no, no, I'll, I'm now going to actually try and establish why I've come to these conclusions. We all know the limitations of low molecular weight heparin and vitamin K antagonists. Um, the limitations aren't the point. The point is that they lead to poor adherence. And they lead to poor adherence not just from the patients, but the doctors. The doctors are not prescribing the low molecular weight heparin because of these limitations. And that means patients aren't getting guideline recommended therapy. And that's a problem. Who's been studied? Well, Simon has already told you, not all patients. So I'm gonna go through something similar to what Simon said about who hasn't been studied. First of all, if we look at the percentage of cancer patients that were in each of the studies, we can see here for each of the studies around 5% of patients. Now, in an inception cohort where you've got new patients without a history of VTE, about 15 to 20 odd percent are cancer patients, not 5%. This is about a quarter of the number of cancer patients you would expect to be in studies, unless they were highly selected. In a prevalent cohort where you have recurrent patients, you might get as high as 20 to 30% of patients have cancer associated thrombosis. So these are highly selected. If you look at that horizontal histogram, you'll see the number of patients with cancer in dark blue up there compared to the no cancer patients, and it's not even close to representing the real world. What sort of cancers do they have? The thing is that we put patients in studies 
because we know they're going to have recurrences. We want patients to have high recurrences. That's why we see plenty of haematological, lower GI, lung, but not so many breast. You can't see any prostate cancers. You can't see any pancreatic cancers. In fact, if we look just at the Einstein studies, we can see of the lung a total of 60 patients. It's not enough. Why do, am I confident in saying that this is not representative of cancer VTE patients? I'm confident because this year we published this study of 6,592 or something like that, I can't remember. Yep, 592 patients with <laughs> active cancer. The most active cancer, these are ones with a diagnosis or surgery or treatment within three months. Not six months, like the current definition, but three months. Look which cancers, in the right-hand column, look which cancers have the highest percentage prevalence. In men, it's prostate cancer. In women, it's breast cancer. And then in men and women, it's lung cancer, colon, and so on. So the ones we put in the studies are not the most prevalent types of cancer. They're the ones with the highest incidence rates. So that's one limitation of the studies. The other thing is that they vary in incidence. And we can see here that the incidence changes. So these are all breast and colon and bladder low, colon a bit higher. We can see lung is high, but uterus is low, and so on and so forth. There's great variation. And unless we include a mixture of patients, we won't get a true picture of what's going on. We also published this year in this paper that the incidence rate increases with age. And if you've got patients between 40 and, and, and 60, they have half the incidence rates of patients that are 70 and 80. And we don't get many 70 and 80 year olds in studies. We get 40 and 60 year olds in studies. So we're, looking, we're not looking at the older population and we're not looking at the patients that are dying early. And this is a poster we presented a couple of years ago looking at mortality by lung cancer type and showing the excess mortality which Anthony Maravais has talked about in the first 30 days of having a cancer diagnosis or cancer treatment. And we can see that patients, some patients with pancreatic, lung, even prostate cancers and colon cancers die very early if they develop VTE. We don't know how to manage them either. And finally, as the other speakers have shown, and we've shown in our study, these are the recurrence rates. The recurrence rates are maximum in the first zero to six months, the first six months. They're still high at six to 12 months, but by after 12 months, the recurrence rates are relatively low in an inception cohort. And so we need to get to the patients very early after the diagnosis. There are some unmet needs and there are some things we just don't know about. And some of the things we don't know about are head-to-head -head studies with NOACs and low molecular weight heparin, and I'll show you that data. Uh, or I'll show you what's coming, I should say. Um, the extended anticoagulation that Dr. McDonald will be talking about after me. The dosing with chemotherapy and the um, side effects and how to manage drug-drug interactions, and what it's like for patient satisfaction as well. So there's a lot of areas we need to investigate in cancer-associated thrombosis. So, let's come back to this question. Who would you give an oral anticoagulant to? Not just a DOAC, but any oral anticoagulant. Well, in the real world, we treat patients with oral anticoagulants with the less severe DVT or PE. The more severe PEs, we treat with thrombolysis, we treat more severe DVT with perhaps interventions or consider thrombolysis in some, but then generally 
poplar teal and more distal, segmental and subsegmental PE, patients with less severe symptoms, and those at lower risk of recurrence. And they're the patients with localised cancers, with resected cancer, less aggressive cancers, not on chemotherapy, without a previous history of VTE, and after initial low molecular weight heparin therapy. Now these are my personal views on what the data allows us to do. These are not guideline related views, but this is what I think are the right patients that we can clearly treat based on the evidence we have with DOAX and other oral anticoagulants. The thing is that we have to determine what's cured and what's not cured. And I think we now, the consensus has moved on since we did our study, there's more of a six month rule. And cured or inactive means successful treatment, surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, no residual disease, no METs, no, low, low risk of recurrences, and a disease free interval. And active cancer is just everyone else anyone who doesn't meet the inactive criteria. But we kind of know that there's a bit of blurring here because if you have a patient that has a resection of a small tumour, four months down the line they haven't got active cancer but they're still considered to have active cancer. So you have to have some common sense in when you're managing these patients. Why did we even want to try the DOACs in this situation because they're oral, they're fixed dose, no lab monitoring, no risk of HIT. What did we see? Well, initially we published um, in uh, Lancet Hematology that when we looked at the rivaroxaban patients in the pooled analysis of the Einstein studies, we saw a favourable reduction in major bleeding and a strong trend towards a reduction in recurrences and the net clinical benefit was clearly in favour of rivaroxaban over vitamin K antagonists. And then Maria Vedavati, one of uh, my students, she did this meta-analysis and she did this meta-analysis looking at all the studies that we performed and what she found in this study was that there was a strong trend towards a reduction in recurrences, not significant. You can see, if you look at the bottom of the diamond, that it just gets close to the line there, it just goes over the line. But something given that there's only about 500 patients in each group that makes you think this might have something in it compared to vitamin K antagonists. And with bleeding, the diamond went in the right direction again a reduction but not significant in major bleeding and a non-significant reduction in clinically relevant non-major bleeding. What do we do with that data? What do we do? Do we, do we get excited? Do we jump in or are we more careful? Well, I think the conclusions are that the DOACs are just as effective, possibly more effective but just as effective, just as safe potentially a little bit safer, but they're an alternative in certain circumstances. Do we get excited about that? Well, this is actually a love child of the chairman, actually, and uh, he jumped in too quickly, as you can see. He went straight for the chest expansion on the patient instead of thinking about the patient preferences and expectations. And I would suggest to you that this lovely Korean love child of Professor Noble is jumping in too early, you know. And what you need to do is think about who are the right patients to, to use DOAX in. Why do we need to think about that? Because there are few cancer patients, as I said. There are no randomised controlled trials comparing the new agents with low molecular weight heparin. The oral route might be not ideal in patients that are vomiting with nausea and anorexia, which is common in the cancer setting, and we're looking into that at the moment, we're producing a consensus statement on that. We don't know some, many of the interactions with the cancer drugs, but what we've seen so far, and we're doing interaction studies at the moment, is that they're relatively few. We have limited experience in liver and renal impairment, but we're getting that. Uh, 
And we don't know so much about reducing the dose in patients with thrombocytopenia, which we might do with, say, low molecular weight heparin. And then we have no evidence of a survival of, uh, uh, benefit uh, or any anti-tumoral activity. So these are just some of the drugs. The, the, the ones of interest to you are not so much the immunosuppressants in the top section, but in actual fact, um, the, the chemotherapeutic agents. And there is uh, some, some, certainly some reduced uh, plasma levels uh, with some of the chemotherapy and, some, and certainly dexamethasone. So we need, we need to keep this in mind when we're treating the patients with NOACs. The ACCP came to the same conclusion. We need to first of all use low molecular weight heparin and then for all the oral therapies, VKA, dabigatran, rivaroxaban, apixaban, adoxaban, it's 2C. Low molecular weight heparin, if they're the right sort of patient, if they've got active cancer, if they can tolerate the injections, but the others, 2C. They've slightly revised that. They're now saying maybe it's 2B for for, for NOAX and 2C for um, for, um, for uh, vitamin K antagonists. But they also say that the choice of therapy long term, and I'm sure uh, Dr. McDonald will go into this, um, it can be variable. It can be VKA or NOAX, um, if they're not treated with low molecular weight heparin and they don't have a preference for one NOAC over another. What's happening in the future? Well, there are three studies. Um, there's the Hokusai Cancer Study, which is uh, a large study, which is coming to completion. There's the Callisto program, including the Select D study, which looks at low molecular weight heparin versus vitamin K antagonists with rivaroxaban. But there's another nine or 10 uh, studies within the Callisto program looking at quality of life, etc. And recently, the Caravaggio study, study has started with a Pixaban uh, versus low molecular weight heparin. So there'll be data coming out this year uh, from some of the Callisto program, and uh, there'll be data also, I hope, later this year on the Hokusai study. So just to conclude, um, we know that low molecular weight heparins are more effective than VKA for CAT. We know that NOACs appear to be as good as and maybe better than VKA. The NOACs can be used to treat CAT, I think in patients with a lower risk of recurrence, as we saw in the various DOAC studies. Uh, the patients that are no longer severely ill, uh, where indefinite anticoagulation is required, so you could switch them after a period of low molecular weight heparin uh, once the cancer becomes inactive and based on the preference of the patients. I'll say nothing more, but that's it. Thank you.